All right, well, good to see everyone tonight. Yes. All of our jolly selves. <laughs> <laughs> We're having more fun in our worship services. And, hey, all the word coming forth, like I said, we could go home now and yeah. already have yeah. another service. But uh, thank the Lord for those that are watching, that are on Facebook Live, those that will watch this on YouTube and the audio platforms as well. And since we haven't been here for a couple of weeks, what I want to do is go back and repeat just briefly. There's one specific area of scripture that I want to repeat and revisit. Uh, so I'm going to just reiterate a few things. Then what we're going to talk about today is the subjective experience of immortality can be hastened when it's voice activated. And then we're going to talk about three different dynamics of things that in order for us to subjectively experience immortality. Now, objectively, we already are immortal. We already are. A lot of people don't believe that, but we already are immortal objectively. And in other words, we have the seed of immortality within us. And again, science is beginning to uh, realize that we have, as they say, an immortal gene. I say, as we sang tonight, all of ourselves are full of light yes. and life and spirit. We're just as spirit in our body as we, have, as we are in our spirit and in our heart awareness. So that's what we're going to talk about. But let me just reiterate just a little bit because if you recall, two weeks ago, we talked about victory being in life, not in death. Right. Yes. So many people believe, oh, if I could just die and go to heaven, yes. I'll have victory and I'll reign in life. No, no, no. His purpose, and I'm not saying that when a person physically dies, they don't live on. Certainly they do. But the gospel, you can hear this, the gospel is living in the here and the now, bypassing the grave. Right. Bypassing physical death. And this is what this series is all about. So we're going to talk about that. What we saw a couple of weeks ago when we talked about reigning in life and not reigning in death and we talked also about the reality of deathlessness. Yeah. We talked about the fact and we saw that physical death also is not our savior. Mm -hmm. And heaven is not what solves all of our problems. Right. Right. Oh, if I could just go to heaven, die and go to heaven, yeah. all my problems would be yeah. over. <laughs> I'm not saying they wouldn't be over, but I'm simply saying, is that a cop out? Yeah. It absolutely is. When we have been given life and we've been told to choose life. Yeah. Okay? So, Scripture does not tell us in Romans chapter 8 that the groaning creation is waiting for the rapture, or a rapture. The groaning creation is not waiting for a physical man to hop on a white stallion and come back and make everything right. Creation is not waiting for that. Creation is not waiting for a physical death. It doesn't say that. But what it says, and let me read a couple of verses, Romans 8, 19, for the earnest expectation of the creature or creation, some translations say creation is on tiptoe, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's what they're waiting for. Yeah. Not a rapture, yeah. not to physically die, not for a second coming where Jesus literally comes back. What are they waiting for? The manifestation yeah. of the sons of God. But then it goes on to say, and it describes what the manifestation of the sons of God are experiencing to right. make the grown in creation desire to have what we have. Right. It says not only they, verse 23, Romans 8, 23, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we grown within ourselves, yep. waiting, listen, it says for the adoption, but it means the placing, okay? The placing or to come to experience, yep. or as it says, to wit, or to know, and to know means to experience the redemption of the body. Amen. So they're looking for a people that are experiencing and know that they already have bodily redemption, that they're not mortal, and we're going to unpack that next week. Why does it say that the spirit that reigns Jesus will quicken your mortal body? We're going to talk about that next week. Not going to jump into that tonight. But they are waiting. The groaning creation, you know, there's a godly jealousy that the scripture talks about. So there's a godly jealousy of those that are not experiencing what we're coming into. They're just experiencing religiosity, or some are not even experiencing yeah. religiosity. Right. Some are experiencing nothing. Right. But they see us, and they see us getting a diagnosis 
some of us, Mom. you're going to die in three days, Mom. and they don't die. Yes. Wouldn't you think someone would question and want to know yes. what it is yes. about you no. that when you were given three days to live, you lived on instead? Yeah. So they come and they're waiting to see a people that are bearing the fruit of immortality. Yes. And it's yes. not fruit that's yeah. just yeah. here and gone tomorrow. It that's is fruit sure. that remains. Amen. Right. Now, I read you a post last week. In fact, I read, or two weeks ago, two posts that I wrote. You can go to my Facebook and find them. One of them was about the groaning creation waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. And I shared with you how we've always been taught, squirrely teaching on that, that there's going to be this climactic event where all of a sudden this is going to happen. All of a sudden the groaning creation is going to desire to experience what the people that are already experiencing yes. are experiencing. Yes. But what I shared with you and what I wrote on that post, as I said, you can go back and read it, is this is happening now on a one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm believing through this series of teachings there are going to be more people, and I know there are because it's already happening. Mm -hmm. In fact, someone offered to write this book for me uh, this past week mm -hmm. to take this series on what about those bodies and put it in book form for me. Right. And I said, yes, you can go ahead and do that. Wow. And so it will eventually be a book. But the groaning creation waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God is already happening now. Right. People are beginning to hear. Yes. People are beginning to realize. Mm -hmm. People are beginning to, it's the age of Aquarius, folks. It's the yeah. age of enlightenment. Yes. And, and truth is coming like never before. Mm -hmm. And people are beginning to wake up. Not so much wake up, but become aware. Because yes. I believe we're already yes. awake. Yes. But become aware of the truth that these things are not just future now they may intensify as time goes on and naturally they will but they're already happening Amen. Amen. and then i read a post that i wrote where we talked about the fact and the scripture says receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your souls mm. now i heard that taught as when we come to the end of life mm. receiving the salvation of your souls and, and they've taught it many ways. One way they've taught is when you physically die, you get your reward. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the end of the salvation of your soul. But what it means, as I looked up some words and did some word studies, I found out that, listen, let me say it again, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, what is it? That is yielding the left side to the right side. And it is the joining of the masculine and the feminine because something transpires in the soul or in the heart awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's where the formation, that's where Paul said, I travail again until Christ be formed in you. Where's Christ formed in us? Mm -hmm. In our heart awareness. Yeah. That's the formation. And when the formation takes place, then it's out pictured or it's manifested outwardly. <laughs> so it takes the joining together of the masculine and the feminine, you see, mm -hmm. For us to move out of just the objective reality of immortality and come into the subjective experience of immortality. Mm -hmm. yeah. We talked about that. Now, yeah. what I want you to do is go to Romans chapter 5. I believe this bears repeating. And we looked at this last, or two weeks ago. We looked at this two weeks ago, but I want to read it again. And then we'll get into the message for tonight. Romans chapter 5. Is anybody warm in here tonight? No? Okay. I am. But if you're not, okay. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Yes. Yeah, why don't you turn it down just a notch or two? I don't want to freeze you out, but I'm hot tonight. <laughs> In more than one way, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> maybe I'm dressed too warm. <laughs> Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Now I want to read 13 through 17. As I said, we did this two weeks ago, but there's something here I want us to really look at again. Because we're going to really, listen folks, can I say it this way? This series of teachings is happening in me already. Yeah. This series of teachings is bringing and going to bring something that I have not seen. Wow. Yes. Ear hath not heard. Yeah. Yeah. Neither has it entered into the heart of man. But, 
Spirit is going to reveal to us. Spirit is revealing to us now and going to continue to reveal to us. Now, let's read here, verse 13 in Romans 5. For unto the law, sin was in the world. Did you know that sin was in the world before the Mosaic law came? Mistaken identity yes. was in the world before that. Yeah, okay. Then it goes on, but sin is not imputed where there is no law or when there is no law. Verse 14, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, a death consciousness yeah. from Adam to Moses. Listen, and not because mankind automatically received that from Adam when Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but because they didn't know any better. Okay, let me read that again, verse 14. That nevertheless, death reigned, where? Between our ears, yeah. from Adam to Moses, meaning a death consciousness, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come? In other words, there was a death consciousness, not because they inherited Adam's so-called fall, but because they just didn't know any better. And the same way with us, we did not inherit a fall from Adam automatically. We inherited a death consciousness because we embraced religiosity. Yes. All right? Verse 15, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Now listen to this. For if through the offense of one, many be dead. Now the many means all. Many in the Greek means all mankind. For if, now listen, you've got to stick with that word if. If is a question. Yes. Yeah. If can be posed as a question. If something happens. Okay? Or in other words, it can have kind of a, a mixture of if, like not knowing. Okay? If, like, I don't know. If through the offense of one, many be dead, or all mankind, listen to this now, much more, the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many, or to all men. We gotta get the much more, because it cancels out the if. Yes. Something that's much more than an if this happened, cancels out the if this happened. And in this case, it was if Adam's transgression caused all men to have a death consciousness. I'm going to show you something about this that I didn't bring out a couple weeks ago. Look at verse 16. And not as if it was by one that sinned. Wow. Notice if again. Yeah. And not as if it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. What is that saying there? Well, if you think that Adam brought judgment into your life, think again. Something greater came, and it was the free gift, which was before Adam even partook of the tree of the knowledge of evil. Now, verse 17. Listen to this. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one. So if you think it did, if you think that Adam, by partaking of death or the tree of knowledge of good and evil, caused you to automatically fall into sin consciousness, think again. <laughs> because, notice what it goes on to say, because much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness, now listen to this, shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now, notice it doesn't say shall reign in death after they die. Their body is buried in the grave. No. And again, I'm not saying there's not continued life after that. There is. And we looked at that when we talked about Jesus and Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. We saw that. But there were two solutions there. One is if a person dies, they can be resurrected. That's Jesus when he said, I am the resurrection. But when he said, I am the life, he was saying, but those who believe this and believe into me shall never die, can you believe this? Yes. So that's talking about two solutions there. But what I want to get at here is if we can, in our awareness, understand what the if is all about here and what the much more is about here, then guess what? We will realize we were never an Adam. Yeah. 
we will realize that, you know, as Ezekiel said, the children ate the sour, the fathers ate the sour grapes and it set the children's teeth on edge. He said, don't say that. And what that meant was you're going to inherit from your ancestors. He said, say this, the soul himself that sins shall experience death. Okay. So what this is saying is, if we can understand the if, the if factor here, and if we can understand the much more factor, and if we can understand that we were in Christ before Adam ever partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, yeah. and if we can understand that the much more of anything cancels out the if, then we can reign in life. Yeah. Plain and simple, we can reign yeah. in life. And you see, by believing that Adam's sin caused us to listen be in mistaken identity automatically, then we have missed what we have read here. We've missed the if, yeah. and we've missed the much more. Yeah. And we thought, well, yes, it was much more because Jesus came to get us out of Adam. Yeah. No, that's really not what it's saying there. That's what religion has taught. So if we can understand that the much more cancels out the if we were ever in Adam, then we can reign. I mean, that's a beginning for us to realize that we can reign in life rather than death. Now notice here, two times, this is significant, two times in verses 15 and 17, it uses the words much more. Yeah. Much more. Notice that at the end of verse 17, it states of those who get what the much more is revealing, they reign in life, not in death. So in other words, teaching that one must physically die, and then you can reign in that realm of life is not what it's saying here. So what am I saying? I am emphatically saying the gospel is living, yes. not dying and going by the way of the grave. That is the gospel. Every time someone was raised from the dead, that was a message to us to tell us, listen, you don't have to die. Amen. You don't have to go by the way of the Amen. grave. You are the body of Christ. You are bone of his bone. You are flesh of his flesh. Your body is just a spirit as your spirit is spirit. So we don't have to go by the way of the grave. And again, in John chapter 11 is where we read about where Jesus said to one of the sisters of Lazarus, what did he say? I am the resurrection, solution one. If you die, you can either be resurrected, or you can go on in that life and experience that dimension of life. But when he said, I am the life, in verse 26, he also said, and whosoever liveth or stays alive and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? Yes. I remember after my husband passed away, and it'll be 18 years this November, doesn't seem like it. Yeah. I heard him come back to me and say, keep your body. Yeah. <laughs> keep your body. Keep your body. Yeah. Don't lose your body. And I'll go ahead and throw this. Dr. Bill Hanshu went to pray for his father. He was filled with cancer. And he walked in, him and his wife, Dr. Faye, and said, we have a miracle for you. He said, I don't want a miracle. His father said. He shortly died. And then Dr. Bill said he heard the words, Shoot, I could have had life. I could have had life. So listen, in wow. death is not of God. I'm going to read you something from the book of Solomon in a little bit. But beyond the shadow of a doubt, we'll show you death was never in God's plan. He never made man to die. He made provision if he does die. But it was never God's plan. Where would God get death? In fact, where it says, I've said before you life and death. The death was brought forth by man's religiosity. Yeah. He brought forth life. Yes. Yeah. And he told us even what to choose. Yeah. Yeah. Choose life. And he even categorizes it. <laughs> he, he calls the, the life good, and he calls the death evil or bad. Yeah. Now, in order to reign in life, listen, we cannot allow apanesco, apanesco, which is the Greek word for death, we cannot, in order to reign in life, we cannot allow death into the areas where we have been given dominion. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so mortal death is the recognition, listen, of a life lived under the government of decay and deterioration. Yeah. And the true gospel of Jesus Christ 
is freeing us and has freed us from every kind of death in every area. In our bodies, in our souls, in our finances, in our social life, in our relationships, in every area. Every kind of death. We have been made exempt from every kind of death. Amen. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Amen. And get high on the most high. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, now let's, let's get into the message tonight. I said we're going to talk about the subjective experience of immortality and how that subjective experience of immortality can be hastened if it's voice activated. And then we're going to talk about three dynamics of immortality in order for us to subjectively experience it. What does it mean when I say voice activated? Well, and why do I say that? We must watch our words. Yes. Yeah, and see, sure. I have been dealt with about even joking about death. Yeah. Wow. You know, we have little cliches. Oh, I'm thrilled to death. Yeah. Or I love you to, to death. Or, you know, little cliches that we say about death. Yeah. And you know what? Stop it. Yeah. Stop it. So let's put the shut to the up, yeah. even allowing death in yeah. improper ways. Now, sometimes you have to use that word. Someone dies or some poor, something like that. But we need to even refrain from joking and making you know, comments about, I love you to death, or, you know, I was scared to death, or, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Now, yeah. why do I say this? Why do I say immortality can be hastened when his voice activated? Well, first of all, let me throw a few scriptures out to you. Proverbs 18, 21, the power of death and life are in the tongue. Right. <laughs> Isn't that simple? The power of death and life are in the tongue. Amen. Matthew 12, 37, by our words, we are condemned yeah. or we're justified. Amen. It might be the other way around, justified or condemned. I'm not sure. Yeah. I didn't go there and look it up. Yeah. By our words, we are justified or condemned. Yeah. What does it mean to be condemned? Just not experience right. that which is already ours. Not experience it. Wow. Now, when we started this series, if you remember, we went to Deuteronomy chapter 30, where it tells us there that we are to choose life. Choose life or good, it says. Categorizes them. Life is good. We are to choose life rather than death and evil or bad. And then it tells us what to do about that. Life and death is set before us. It's our choice. Yeah. Amen. Now listen, if it's our choice, that means I have dominion. Yeah. And I have a say-so in yep. it. Yep. Right. I don't have to go with the run of the mill, you know, right. of right. everybody croaking eventually. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to say it that way. <laughs> but I don't have to go that route. Right. Because he told us to choose life in Deuteronomy yeah. chapter yeah. 30 and verse 15. Now, if he told us to choose life, and I'm saying this again, repeating for emphasis, that means you and I have dominion. Yeah, yeah. come on. Uh, Amen. Uh, uh, uh. Well, he would not tell us to choose life if we didn't have a choice. Come on. Right. You and I have dominion. In Genesis, he said, let them have dominion. Remember, yeah. we talked about not taking dominion. It's not fighting. It's not life over death as in a fight, getting a greater power to overcome what we consider to be a lesser power. No, have dominion means we, we have it from a work that has been finished from before the foundation. Yes. We forgot it, and then Jesus in his death exposed those lies of the power of so-called death. Amen. And in his resurrection, he revealed the truth about the fact that we have, and we are in possession of immortal life. Yeah. That's what he revealed to us. Now, let me give you the three dynamics, first of all. The first one, very simple, I've already said it. You have a choice. Come on. And the very fact that you and I have a choice means yep. we have dominion. Yep. We've been given dominion. Number two is confession. Yep. It's voice activated. Hmm. Now, yep. we're immortal, as I said earlier, objectively, but to subjectively experience it when, you know, we actually are walking in it and others see it. Yes. When we're actually subjectively walking in it, that's the subjective experience. And the only way that that's going to happen, and we can, listen, we can hasten. I, I know I sat in a teaching for years that said, well, everyone in the body is going to come into this at one time. I disagree. I disagree. Yeah, right, right. Because we have the choice. We have choice. 
That doesn't mean someone that comes in and before is greater than the other person. Right. Because you're all immortal. Amen. Already. Yeah. But what it means is that person has sat with it. Yeah. Well. They've contemplated it. They've meditated on it. The church doesn't like that either, to meditate. So, number one, it's a choice. Number two, it is voice activated. In other words, we must speak words of spirit and life. And number three is we must be aware. Hosea chapter four, verse six says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Some translations say, my people perish yeah. Yeah. for lack of knowledge. Right. Now listen to the word perish in the Hebrew. Yeah. It's different in the Hebrew than in the Greek, and then I'll give you the Greek. The word perish in Hebrew means to die. Yeah. Wow. Physically, to pass away. Mm -hmm. Succumb, to rot, to vanish, Jesus. and to cease. So my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people rot, deteriorate, yeah. pass away, succumb, vanish, cease to be. See, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, and my people perish for lack of knowledge. They die. Yeah. Now someone says, what are you going to do with John 3.16? What does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And listen, only begotten doesn't mean he was the only one. Right. right. Only begotten means when he was tempted, he never fell for it. That's really what it means. Some places it says when it talks about Jesus Christ being son, it says a son. Not the son. Because we're all sons. That's not what I'm after. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. Now listen to this, because this is what perish means. But, I like the buts, but have everlasting life. Right. So perish means you're not experiencing this everlasting life. Amen. Or eternal life. Now, eternal life is a, it's not quantity, it's a quality of life that brings about then quantity. Wow. Yeah. For many days. Right. Now, let's go to <laughs> Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. Eternal life. So, so to perish in John 3.16 just means yep. that some individuals are not experiencing the everlasting or the eternal life. That's all it means. They're just not experiencing. You know, they're kind of like you go into the grocery store and you can see lettuce or fruit and some of it's, you know, maybe yeah. a little wilted or, or a little rotten. It's not experiencing life. Yeah. See? You want the fruit the, and the lettuce that's experiencing <laughs> life, not the wilted stuff, not the rotten stuff, right? right? So that's the difference here in John 3, 16 between perish. But you know what I was taught? Perish means you're going to go to hell in a handbasket yeah. and yeah. you're going to be yeah. scorched and torched and burned right. forever. And more than that, God's going to pour gasoline on your underwear and throw you in the lake of fire. Yeah. Just don't wear underwear. Huh? Yeah. Were you taught that something similar to that? They yeah. may not have used those drastic of words, but that's so what we were taught. Yeah. Right? Yes. Now, look at Revelation 1.18. You there? Yeah. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. So yeah. good. Talking about Jesus. Yeah. And have the key. And listen, you have the same thing that Jesus has. Okay? Yeah. He's our elder brother. He doesn't want us to worship him. He wants us to do what he said. Yes. Right? He's our elder brother. You don't worship your brother, do you? No. Of course not. <laughs> she said that before. <laughs> True. Jesus, you know, people are worshiping Jesus today. Now, I understand he's the eternal Christ now because he died and he rose and he ascended. He was turned inside out so that he could come into us in spirit not come into us in spirit in the way we were taught to come into yes, us in spirit, yes, yes. but for us to realize we've always had spirit yes, in us. Yes. And where it says that, that Jesus said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And then it says he breathed upon them. And breathe just simply means he generated that which was already in them. But anyhow, I don't want to talk about that. The last part here now, Revelation 1.18 says, and have, Jesus had the keys of hell and of death. But so do you. 
Yeah. How did he know he had the keys of hell and death? He was aware and conscious of his I amness. Yeah. Yeah. And because he was aware of his I amness, he had the keys of hell and of death. Yeah. That's good. But you do too. Yeah. Yeah. Now, let me show you something here. For example, if you have the keys, because notice it doesn't say the keys to hell yeah. or to death. Yeah. Yes, or actually of. Of hell and of death. If you have the keys to the bank, you can only get in the front door. Maybe the back door. But if you have the keys of the bank, you can get in every door and every vault and every place in yeah, that that's bank. Good. That's good. So what does that have to do with this? To have the keys of hell means that you can lock up every aspect of hellish thinking. Amen. Amen. And to have the keys of death means that you can lock up every kind of death, every kind of death, Amen. because the classic Amplified of 1 Timothy 6.16 says, you are exempt from every kind of death. Amen. Every kind of death. Amen. I mean, what kind of death could you think of besides every kind of death? There is no other kind of death if it's involving every kind of death. Right? Just like all is all. I know some people want to make it a few. Yeah. If you, you know, walk the green mile, confess your sin, and Jesus will jump in, and you're saved. You're right back to doing what Adam did. Yes. He yep. thought he could do something to be like God when yeah. he already was. Like but religion is doing it constantly. Yep. Now, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, Hebrews chapter 11, I'm just going to quote this one, verse 3. It says, the worlds were framed by the word of God. And I want to submit to you that you and I frame things by our words. Wow. In Genesis it says that Adam was told to name all of the little critters. Mm -hmm. And when he named them, that's what they were. That was their nature. Mm -hmm. In fact, we name and we frame our world by our words, which flow out of our heart awareness of knowing the truth. Let me say that again. You and I name and we frame our world by our words. Amen. So if you're having a hard time in life, change, your words. change what you put between yeah. your ears and then change your words. Amen. Now listen to this. Here's the word framed in the Greek. I love this. We frame, we name and we frame our world by our words. For the most part, we do. Yeah. The word framed in Greek means to render complete. Wow. You want to render yourself complete? Yes. Everybody else? You frame your world Amen. by what you put between your ears and then the words that you speak out of your mouth. Yeah. Framed means to render complete. It means to outfit. 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 Equip. Hmm. Put in order. Put in order. Arrange. And make it as it ought to be. Make it as it ought to be. Yes. Make it as it ought to be. So if your life is in turmoil uh -oh. today, you can make it what it ought to be. Yes. You can make it what the purpose of God says that it is, Amen. already is. Amen. And it's not so much changing. The only thing that changes is right here. Yes. And, and I could say here too, our words begin to change. Yeah. Amen. And then we're just being who we have always just been. Amen. So let me say this. Yes. The process, do you know you're co-creators tonight? Yes. So the process of co-creating happens when the voice joins with the invisible right here and then is outpictured or manifested. Amen. Say that again. The process of co-creation, because we're creators, co-creators with him. By the power of the spirit, we're co-creators. And this process of co-creation happens when the voice that comes out of our mouth joins with the invisible in our heart awareness and is out pictured in manifestation. Amen. Amen. Let Amen. me give you some scripture. Go to Proverbs 13, verse 3. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 3. And then I want to add that to James 3, 1 through 6. So if you want to go to both of those, I'm going to be reading quite a few verses in James, but one verse in Proverbs 13, 3. Listen, folks, we've we got to keep our mouth. Yeah. Got to keep
keep our mouth. And that's what it says here. He that keepeth his mouth. He that keepeth his mouth. See, because your tongue yeah. is as a ready rider. Your tongue is the sword of the word. Absolutely. Yeah, right? We can see that in the book of Revelation yes. where Jesus spoke, you know, yes. the word yes. came out of his mouth as a sword. Yes. So, so the sword of the word is our tongue. Yes. So Proverbs 13, 3, he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. Wow. Oh, wow. wow. Want to keep your life? Keep your tongue. Amen. That is so good. You want to keep your life? Keep your tongue. Amen. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Oh, think about it. He that openeth wide his lips yeah, shall have destruction. So listen, folks, you got to keep your life by keeping your words or keeping your mouth, as it says here. Now, let's couple that with James chapter 3. Let's go back to James chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll get to what Solomon had to say in the book of Solomon, which was not put in the canon of scriptures along with the Gospel of Thomas and some of the other books. You know, I remember years ago hearing a minister say, and I'm not going to name his name because you all would know him. He said, well, the book of Thomas wasn't put in there, and the book of Esther wasn't put in there, and, and maybe some shouldn't have been, and Solomon, the book of Solomon wasn't put in there. He said, the reason it wasn't put in there is because you don't need that. Now I disagree with that. I think some of those books were taken out by the translators, and by the Catholic Church, and whoever was involved in putting this canon of Scripture together, because they wanted to control us. Yeah. Right. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, James chapter 3, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. All right, we're back on. Sorry about that. That, was, that happened once before. So let me go back again in James chapter 3. What are we doing? We are connecting Proverbs 13, 3, which says, he that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life. You want to keep your life? Keep your mouth. That's right. But he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. You just speak any old thing out of your mouth? Perish. Yeah. Destruction. Now, James 3, 1 through 6. I want to couple that with Proverbs 13 and verse 3. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Verse 2. For in many things we offend all. So let's not be offensive to our physical bodies. Right. Let's not be offensive to our, to our life. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. That's so good, Kate. The body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, maybe we need a bit in our mouth, yeah. <laughs> that they would obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Amen. Behold also the ships, which, though they be great, so great, and are often driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Verse 5, and so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Yep. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. Right. So in a nutshell, what these verses are telling us, you are naturally immortal. We're naturally immortal. Did you hear that? That's your natural life. But our tongue can turn the course of nature. Wow. Yeah. Our tongue can turn that. Absolutely. So what this is conveying here in Proverbs 13, 3, James 3, 1 through 6 is simply put the shut to the end. Yeah. Do not allow, even in joking, words of death to come out of your mouth. Right. Amen. In other words, like we did this, you know, it really hit me this week. This series we did on mind-brain connection for over three and a half years was the prerequisite for what we're going to talk yes. about here in this yes. series of teachings. So what this is saying is you've got to yield the tongue to the Christ mind. Why? Simply because our words frame our world and help us keep our life. 
help us keep our life. Now, let me have you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 30, because I want to point out a few things here in Deuteronomy chapter 30. First of all, in verse 11, it tells us, very clearly it states, that choosing life or death is not a mystery. In other words, it shouldn't be confusing. Right. It's not hard to understand. Absolutely. It's so simple a child could understand it. Right? Choosing life or death is not a mystery. Come on. Now, why did he say that? Well, look at verses 12 through 14. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us? I could interpret that allegorically and say, you keeping your life is not dependent whatsoever on someone laying hands on you yeah. and bringing something to you. Yeah. Now, listen, although we do that occasionally, and there's nothing wrong with that, but hopefully we come to the place, and I believe one of the greater works is to teach people to draw out of their own well. Yeah. And then instead of fruit that's here today and gone tomorrow, it'll be fruit that remains. Because yeah. you may be in a place sometime where you don't have people around you and you yeah. desperately are in need of prayer. Yeah, come on. Or something to take place. Yeah. So you don't need someone no, to go to heaven don't. to get it and bring it to you. You sure don't. Okay? Verse 13. Well, let me finish out. Verse 12. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Verse 13, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us? And sea means humanity. I'm going to go to humanity to get it. Now, in saying that, I'm not saying that I'm against doctors or medicine or anything like that. We do those things until we really are brought to the subjective Amen. experience of immortality. Amen. Then we won't need that anymore. Amen. I'm convinced we won't need that anymore. Yeah. But right now, before we are all experiencing immortality subjectively, yes, we do use doctors, and yes, we do use medicine. I take supplements and, uh, you know, try to eat right and exercise and all that sort of, and all of that helps, but only Christ is immortal. Amen. See? Amen. And eventually, that is what we're going to be drawing on. Amen. So it goes on to say, nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea, humanity, for us and bring it to us that we may hear and do it. Verse 14, but, I'm going to say it this way. It's closer than your breath, nearer than hands and feet. It's not a mystery. Yeah. But the word is very near you, in your mouth, and in your heart, that you may do it. Right. It is what is written upon our heart and our mind. Right. The word, we're living epistles. The word is written upon our heart and upon our mind. We have the Christ mind. Now, allow me to read, before we read a few more verses in Deuteronomy 30, allow me to read from the Book of Wisdom from Solomon, called the Apocrypha, which was removed from the canon in the late 1800s because someone wanted to manipulate us. They wanted us to continually trust in man and have to go to man for help. You know, isn't there a scripture that says, we don't trust in chariots? That's man. We don't trust in man whose breath is in his nostrils. Yeah. Right? We trust in the Father within us. We trust in spirit within us. Now listen to this. This is what it says. The book, like the book of Thomas. Do you know what one of the things that the book of Thomas says? The inside has got to come to the outside, and the outside has got to come to the inside. Yeah. That's what happened in Jesus' transfiguration. The inside came to the outside and appeared on the outside, and the outside turned within. Realizing, what does that mean? I realize I'm spirit inside and I'm also spirit outside. Amen. But I draw from the spirit within me. Yes. Okay? Now listen to this, the Apocrypha. Words of wisdom from Solomon. Seek not death in the air of your life. Wow. <laughs> Seek not death in the air or the mistake of your life. And pull not upon yourselves destruction with the works of your hands. For God made not death. And I could add, he made not suffering. Yeah. For God made not death, neither hath he pleasure in the destruction of the living. Wow. Isn't that good? Wow. Verse 14. For he created all things, listen, that they might have their being. And the generations of the world were healthful. Yeah. Healthful or 
are full of health. Yes. Okay? And there is no poison of destruction in them, nor the kingdom of death upon the earth. For righteousness is immortal. Are you righteous? Yes. You've always been. Yes. For righteousness is immortal. But ungodly men with their works and words call it, or death, to them. For when they thought to have it their friend, wow. how many know? I think it's 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Death is an enemy, not a friend. Yeah. For when they, would, when they thought to have it as their friend, they consumed to not and made a covenant with it, with death. Because they are, listen, because they are worthy to take part with it. Meaning what? They believe that they're worthy of death. Yeah. How many people in religiosity today believe they're not worth anything? Right. And they're worthy of death. Yeah. Yeah. That's the highest reality they can see. Someday, yeah. death is my friend. Yeah. Someday I'm going to be released from this. Yeah. And won't I be in a better place? And that's one thing that really, for many, many years, has really aggravated me. When you go into a funeral home, well, don't they look wonderful? Yes. Right. Yeah, with newspaper in their mouth and half a suit, and yeah. they look real nice, right? Yeah. And I know we say that to comfort the living. I, under, I understand that. But to me, looking at death in the face doesn't look good. No, no, no. It doesn't look nice. I do that every day. So just as in Deuteronomy 30, listen, these words refer directly to our ability to choose. In Deuteronomy, he said, we can do it because it is in our mouth and it's in our heart. And in this book of wisdom, he says that words and works allow death to stay in the scope of people's lives. In other words, one can change their outcome by changing their words and by changing their actions. Amen. 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 Pretty, pretty strong words, right? Yeah. Now let's read on here in Deuteronomy 30. Look at verse 15. See, I have set before you this day life, notice, and good, because yeah. life is good, and death and evil, wow. because death is evil. It's bad. Verse 16. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. Now let me just say, we're not keeping commandments of old. That's not what it's talking about. For us, allegorically, it's talking about his spiritual laws. I wrote a post the other day about spiritual laws. God is, and God is spiritual law. Let me give you an example. Where it says, if your eye be single, your whole body will be filled with light. That's a spiritual law. And as we embrace that and keep that and, and, and endeavor to see with, not these two eyes in our head, but endeavor to see with our single eye, see, that's keeping the spiritual law, and our body will be full of light. Well, it already is, but we'll experience it subjectively. Amen. So when it talks about these commandments and so forth and statutes and judgment, what that means to us is spiritual law, okay? And Jesus set down some spiritual law in the Beatitudes and in the Sermon on the Mount. So let me read that again. In that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. And the land is right here. Yeah. This is yeah, the land. Yes. Allegorically, this is the land. Verse 17. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. You know, when Pam was here, Constantine, she talked about never worshiping other gods. What are the other gods we can worship? Intellect, reason, logic, ego, five senses, emotions. We're setting up another god to worship when we allow our intellect to rule rather than yielding the intellect to the Christ mind and spiritualizing the intellect. Nothing wrong with intellect, but it has to be spiritualized right. by yielding it to the Christ mind. So you set up another God when you're led by those things, right? Yep. Verse 17, but if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce you this day that ye shall surely perish. Physically die is what it means in the Hebrew. Yep. Pass away. 
And it gives the connotation. I didn't say this when I was giving you the uh, meanings of perish in the Hebrew. It also, it also means to perish in a sudden and horrible way. Wow. It even added that. Jeez. To perish in a sudden and a horrible way. I denounce you this day that you shall surely perish, and then ye shall not prolong your days upon the land whither thou passest over Jordan to possess it. Now, let me say something. And this has gotten under my skin for quite a while, too. When people, they read the scripture, I don't know, 1 Corinthians 11 or somewhere in there, that talks about communion. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, if you partake, you know, regularly of communion, uh, you, I don't know how it's worded. Maybe somebody can look that up. You, you won't die prematurely. Yeah. Listen, that's hogwash. Hey. Dying prematurely? Yeah. And I know some people have, but for us to say we don't want to die prematurely, there's no premature about it, folks. Right. Right. There's only life. Exactly. See? There's no premature death. That's not in the kingdom of God. Even though some people do, you die, they die way too young than what they, they should. But that shouldn't even enter the equation, premature death. Sorry, I got off a little tap. <laughs> Verse 19. Yeah. I'm letting out some feelings tonight about some <laughs> things I don't like, right, about death. Verse 19. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, Amen. choose life that Amen. both thou and thy seed may live. Amen. It's going to affect your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids and on down the line. Yeah, yeah. Verse 20, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him, listen, for he is thy life. Yeah. Mm. I say it this way, he is our life as us. Amen. He is our health as us. Yeah. He is our immortality as us. He is that as us. Listen, for he is thy life, and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land, stay in this body, which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give them. So what I'm hearing here is that the writer eliminates every excuse that these people thought they had, and he gave them true prerequisites, and that is, the words in your mouth, so use it, and the words in your heart, so allow it to expand within your heart. Keep adding to it. In other words, your heart awareness is the mechanism by which you know. Because when we put on the mind of Christ, we put it on where? In our heart awareness. And Holy Spirit, our spirit, which is holy, conceives that word, just like a woman conceiving seed, because that is the womb, the womb of the mind, or the womb of the, of the feminine, conceives and quickens that word within us. And then when we speak those words, what do they do? They release the power of life, bringing about the manifestation of that which you already have and you already are. Amen. Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe you already have. Yeah. And you'll have. Yeah. Believe you already have immortality, and you'll have. Amen. Believe it's true of you objectively, and you'll experience it subjectively. Amen. 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 Everything that we perceive is filtered through our understanding. So listen, if you perceive that salvation is escaping hell and making heaven, you're going to interpret everything according to that paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. But once we get out of that... And we realize that salvation is safety, health, protection. And yes, salvation does, you know, go on into after a person dies. Yes, they carry that with them. However, salvation is not about dying and going to heaven. What do you need health there for? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. What do we need safety there for? It's here when we need it. Yep. It's in the lovely here and now. Amen. Some people say the nasty here and now. I don't see it as nasty here and now. Yeah. People say, well, this earth is cursed. You know, this world is going to hell in a handbasket. You know, this is a fallen world. It is a redeemed world, folks. Amen. This world is a redeemed world. It's Amen. full of the glory of God. Amen. Yes. Yeah. And we're the ones that are going to perpetrate that. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Oh, 
We're the ones. The earth has been given to the sons of men. And if people on the earth will not get this understanding, but listen, I promise you they will, we're the ones that cause the, and I, I call it change, it's not so much even a change that needs to come upon the earth today, it is it just being what God created it to be. And it's going to be through a people that will hold that and, and sit with that and meditate on that, and instead of seeing all the chaos and the government, and, and I know it looks like, it looks horrible, I understand that, but to walk by faith and knowing is to see it full of the yeah. glory of God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Paul the Apostle was left for dead on numerous occasions. But he walked in exemption of his body. Exemption from decay, excuse me. He walked in exemption from decay. There were numerous times that Paul was left for dead. And he said in Philippians 3, 11, that he wanted to experience resurrection. Now the Greek word for resurrection, as you know, is anastasis. Something like that. But when he said he wanted to experience the resurrection, it's not anastasis, it's ek anastasis. Ek anastasis. Which means, Paul said, I want to experience the resurrection while still living in the physical body. Wow. Now, I see a little difference between people that were martyred and killed for the gospel. I see a difference in that. And I believe that they paid a price for us as well as Jesus. Yeah, Why? So we can know that we have life, so yeah. we can know that we can receive this life yeah. and walk in it subjectively. More than life, but immortality. Now, John, who wrote the book of Revelation, listen to this. We were talking about this on the way up. The man was boiled in oil. Yes, exactly. How would you like to be boiled in oil? Yeah. And he, was, he must have looked horrible when they drug him out of that oil. Because they sent him to the Isle of Patmos, which means my, my death. Yep. The place of my death. Mm -hmm. And he gets out there, and instead of dying, he gets a revelation. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was translated, listen, in the spirit on the Lord's Day, and that's what the Lord's Day means. You're having a, an experience. He was translated on the Isle of Patmos, the place that should have been his death, but instead he has this revelation, and he sees the Lord Jesus with eyes of fire, hair as wool, feet as bronze, and a sword coming out of his mouth. Whoa. And they say there's no record that John the Apostle that wrote the book of Revelation has ever physically died. Yep. Yeah. No record of it. Yep. No record of John's death to this day. Yep. And listen, what kept him alive? His revelation. Amen. That's what's kept me alive. Yeah. is the revelation that I have. I'm convinced Amen. that this revelation over the years that continued to grow and mount larger and larger is a thing that kept me alive when I had three days to live at one point. I know it's the revelation. Amen. Now let me make a statement. I'm about ready to close here. You can either live by faith or die by faith. You can live by faith or die by faith. Life comes as a seed but death comes as a seed. And we sow either seeds of life into our heart awareness, or we sow seeds of death into our heart awareness. Amen. And here's what happens. What happens is that when our emotions, listen, what happens is that our emotions are accessed into the equation. Let's say, for example, a person gets a bad diagnosis. And that is sown, that seed of death is sown. Maybe they're told, you're gonna to live six months. That seed is sown into their heart awareness and then their emotions are elicited. Yeah. And when their emotions come into the mix, what happens is they make a decision, I'm either going to reject the seed of death or I'm going to receive the seed of life. And from that point on then, our, de our, our decision to speak words of life or words of death come into play. Yeah. Now the scripture I want to give you on that in closing is Hebrews 5, 14. And Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14 tells us that our senses must be exercised. Yeah. 
to discern both good and evil. Now, one translation says that our senses must be exercised. And what does it mean? Exercised in the uh, Greek means strips naked. I can say it this way, they must be yielded. Yeah. When they're stripped naked, they're yielded. Yeah. When you yield your senses, your five senses, Amen. or your emotions, whatever, but especially your five senses, when you yield them to your Christ mind, they're stripped naked. And why is that so important? Because when our senses are stripped naked, this will prevent us from falling. Once we get an evil report, this will prevent us from falling into a downward spiral of death. You will either receive the seed of death into your heart awareness and embrace that. Many times not even knowing, just ignorantly many times people do that. Or you will receive the seed of life and live by faith and know it. That's why I said you can live by faith or you can die by faith. It's our choice. Therefore, any expectation in life that is not an expectation of an ever-expanding kingdom within us must be eliminated. But we have to have our senses. Now, one translation, as I said, because I've taught this Hebrews 5.14 as where it says your senses must be exercised to discern both good and evil, and I've shared that as the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You've got to realize what appears to be good isn't always God. Okay? You have to discern that whether it's good or evil on that tree, it's they're both in the realm of death. But there is a higher good, which is the intrinsic good. Okay? So if we're going to use this verse of Scripture in Hebrews 5.14 and say we must have our senses exercised or stripped naked or yielded to our Christ mind, that is when then... When the senses are stripped naked, you will make the right decision concerning any report that is brought to you. You will reject the seed of death that's trying to enter your womb, or you will embrace the seed of life that's trying to enter your womb. Yeah. When the senses are stripped naked, what did Jesus say? Take no thought. How do you do that? You reject the death which he categorized as evil or bad in Deuteronomy 30. Yeah. But you choose the life. And you can only choose the life when your senses are stripped naked. You hear that? When they're yielded to the Christ mind. That's the only time that we will truly and inevitably, inevitably choose life and then experience this life. So what have we learned tonight? The subjective experience of immortality. Not the objective. You already have that. You are immortal. The subjective experience of immortality can be hastened by speaking words of spirit and life. Yep. Yep. And as we found out tonight, the three dynamics of immortality, number one, is choose life. Yep. When we speak words of life rather than death, we have chosen life. Yep. You can't say, well, I just choose life. It doesn't work that way. It's when you have, listen, when you have spoken words of life instead of death, then you have truly chosen life. Amen. That makes sense, spiritually? Yeah. So the three dynamics, first of all, choose. That's what he said in Deuteronomy 30, 19. Choose life. And you really choose it when you speak words of life. Yeah. And that's the second one. John 6, 63 says Jesus only spoke words of spirit and life. That's all he ever spoke. So we need to conduct our lives that way. Only speak words of spirit and life. Don't even joke about death, folks. That's going to take a little doing because it's easy to do that. Oh, I love you to death. Oh, I'm scared to death. Forget about death. And then the third one was be aware. You will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Amen. Now, I want to read one more scripture to you, and, that's, and you can turn to this one, Isaiah 59, 21, in closing. So Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Speak life. Matthew 12, 37, by your words you're justified. And I'm going to add some words where immortality is concerned. Or by your words you are condemned. By your words you're justified. By your words you're condemned. Condemned what? In that area of experiencing immortality. So 
objectively. Isaiah 59 and verse 21 says, As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee. Now let me say, the spirit is upon all of us. You know why? Because it's in us. Yeah. It has to be in us before it can be on us. Yeah. And how is it on us? Well, it flows from within us. And then it's on us. And that's talking about our earth or our body. Right? As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed. Seeds. That's going to the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren, saith the Lord from henceforth forevermore. So listen, you leave and keep your kids alive, your grandkids alive, your great-grandkids, your great-great-grandkids on the line when they see us walking this. The groaning creation. When they see us walking this and subjectively experiencing this life and immortality, they'll know there's something different about us. Now next week, I'm going to talk about something that's going to be maybe a little different to you. Let me just introduce a little. Scripture talks about we are going from glory to glory. Yeah. And I've heard people preach, and maybe I've said it myself. Oh, we're going, we're moving from glory to glory to glory to glory to glory. There's only two glories there, folks. <laughs> and what is the glory? The view and the opinion. Yeah. So we can either have the view and the opinion of death, which had a glory in the old covenant, or we can move out of the view and the opinion of death into the view and the opinion of life and immortality. Amen. Amen. See, when Moses came down from receiving the law, we've always thought, well, he shone so brightly that they had to put a veil over him. Well, they put the veil over him so that the children of Israel could not see that which was going to be done away with. He did not want them to see, listen, the glory or the opinion of judgment and death. And when we read the scripture on it, I think 2 Corinthians 3, if I'm not mistaken, it says there that the glory of this that we're in now is greater than the glory. So it had a glory back then, but the glory was the opinion of man. It was the opinion of man. It was the opinion of death. It was the opinion of judgment. So we move from that glory into this glory, the opinion of life and immortality. That's so bad. And the glory is much greater, it says, and wherever that is, 2 Corinthians 3. This glory is much greater than the glory. It's so much greater that that glory had no glory in comparison to the glory of today. That's what it says. But we think Moses came down and he lit up like a neon sign or something. No, he didn't want the children of Israel to see that glory that was going to be passing away. He didn't want them to see that because it was nothing but death. And we're going to unpack that next week. And we're going to look at that. It ought to be good. I'm still putting that together. But it'll be a real eye-opener for all of us as we look at that and as we, as we break that open. Bottom line, choose life. Amen. Speak words of spirit and life only. You're told to choose life. So that tells us we have a choice and we have dominion. He wouldn't say choose life if we didn't have dominion. And remember, it's have dominion, not take it, not fight it. Not trying to get a greater power to overcome what we consider to be a lesser power, no. It's just have it from a work that is finished and has always been finished. It was finished from before the foundation. And as I said, we forgot it because we got engulfed in religiosity, told us we're nothing, we're you know, we're an Adam, we're, we're unrighteous, we're unholy. As Colossians 1.21 says, we thought we were alienated and enemies of God in our mind. But it was only in our mind. See? Yeah. So we're going to look at some of these things as we go on in this. It's going to be a real eye-opener for all of us. And it's going to shake up the grown in creation. Wow. Those that will embrace it. Those that will embrace it. It's going to show us that some of these things that we thought were way out there as some climactic event that's going to happen, it's happening right now. It's happening right now. So, Father, we thank you for your Amen. word. Thank you for your truth, for your love, for your grace. Thank you for this people here, for those that are watching and viewing this today. 
We thank you, Father, for a work that has always been finished. And just because we forgot it, Jesus Christ went to the cross, was crucified to expose the lies that we had embraced, and was resurrected to reveal the truth Amen. of who we have always been. We bless you and honor you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.